<laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Now it's time for something completely different. We've been having history. We've been having um, political discussions, policy. One of the ideas behind the Western Naval Historical Association was to provide a venue for people to, people of like interest to get together, to uh, share tips, share ideas, to talk about what they like to do, to basically expand themselves through association. Because I spent 20 or 30 years basically pursuing my, my interests, my enthusiasms by myself. And it's really a pleasure at this point in my life to be able to stand in front of a group of people like this and to say, well, you know, I, I, I enjoy doing naval history and there are certain aspects to it that I do that maybe if I share them with you, it can make your work easier. Maybe you can share something with me, make my work easier. So to that end, we have a presentation here on making your own maps. Um, as Sam said, I make all the maps for my own works. I have the advantage in that I did that professionally. I, I started the company back in the 1990s, the early 1990s called Health Demographics. Back in the days when computer geographic information systems were brand new. And I thought, you know, I can, I can work for um, a company and draw a salary and do this, that, and the other. Or I can do what I like to do. I like to make maps. And I can hopefully make money doing that. And you know, the company, the company kept me alive for 20 years. And in the process, I, I developed a lot of the skills and tools that I needed in order to enhance the works of history that I'm doing. Maybe we can go forward. Uh, can, can you advance me here? The first question is, you know, why do you have maps? Why, why, do, why do you have maps in a book? Why are maps so important in a work of military history? Why are maps so important in any sort of nonfiction? And even if you're reading Agatha Christie, it's kind of nice to have a map of the mansion so you can see where all the rooms where the murder took place. So I think maps have application in almost anything that you do, almost anything that you write, because everything is related to geography. I mean, geography is the one basic fundamental of everything that we do that we kind of ignore because it's just there. I think um, for my own purposes as a reader, I think maps are really important because <clears throat> I like to know where things are. I have this obsession and maybe I'm different in that respect from most people, but I have an obsession where I like to know where things are. And if you're reading complex movements of men and machines and materials over vast distances, if you don't have a map, you're going to miss half the story. That's my opinion. When I write a book, I've gotten to the point where I try to, I try to have every place name that appears in the book on a map somewhere in that book. It's, you know, it's, it's um, easy depending upon what type of book you're writing. It could be very difficult, but it's something that I always strive for. I think that... Um, having maps in your books is very important because you can present historical geography. If you're a historian, you're writing about past times, well, sticking in a map of, of um, modern day Europe, for example, is not gonna show you what was happening in 1939, much less 1914, much less 1703. So you need to have the historical geography in front of you. And you're not gonna find that in most atlases unless you're a person who keeps a collection of historical atlases, which you know most people don't. I think that um, maps are very important for supplementing the text because they can represent very complex relationships visually. You can spend pages and pages and pages describing something. And if you're not a really good writer, those descriptions will tend to be pretty confusing. Or you can present it to per a person in a picture. And you know, I, I have to say it, a picture is worth a thousand words in some cases. And maps are the best way to convey information visually, one of the best ways. Uh, doing that map can replace text. If you're, if you're um, running up against a limitation, which is particularly the case with magazine articles, usually you're working under a very strict limitation of what you can say. If you can save 100 words, 1,000 words of the map, 
that's a good thing. And I think having the skills to be able to do that, to be able to visualize information like that is, is, is something which will enhance your work. It will make your work that much more powerful, that much more appealing to people. And speaking of appealing, I think maps can act as eye candy. I think that, um, maybe I shouldn't admit this, maybe, I, maybe I'm, I'm a bit of an anti-intellectual, but I find page after page after page after page of really dense text to be somewhat, not intimidating, but somewhat you know, boring or uninteresting. And breaking it up with photographs is a good thing. Breaking it up with charts and tables is a good thing. But best of all is breaking it up with maps because maps, the maps that are in your book, your article, or the book that you're reading are individual to that particular work so that they're customized and, and they, they convey more. It's eye candy. And eye candy is a good thing, I think. Plus, finally, maps make things easier for the reader. If you're, if you're reading a book, uh, it, it's, a, it's a refreshment. It's like, it's like a... Um, it's like a um, a candy store that you come to and you can take a pause, you can, you can refresh your mind, refresh your brain with a map. Slide here. So I have been approached by a lot of people in my time. You know, can you make a map for me to do this? Can you make a map for me for this reason? You know, I've done it professionally. I, I do it as favors for my friends. Um, but making maps can be a very difficult thing, can be a very time consuming thing. And I don't have all the time in the world where I can accommodate all the people in the world that might need to be accommodated. And so I've, I've been telling people that it's not that hard to do it yourself. There are certain basic tools you need, certain basic techniques and certain ways to do this that um, aren't that hard. And sometimes all a person needs is just a little bit of a clue or two in order to walk down a different path learn a different skill that will make their work better, make them understand um, perhaps what goes into these things a little bit better. So I'm, I'm before you today to give you a very simplistic, a very easy way to begin the approach to doing maps. Uh, I'm not gonna make, make it seem like it's, you know, something snap. In order for me, and I'm, I'm pretty seasoned at this and I've made I, I can't even begin to think how many different types of maps in my life. Um, my, my, my bread and butter still today is to um, make government compliance maps for healthcare providers, which is a very specialized um, activity, which you know, not that many people can do. That's why they, they pay me to do it for them. And in order to make a good historical map, I can, I can easily spend a day or two, 10, 12, 15 hours. But the good news is, in order to make a decent map that you can use, if you know what you're doing, you can do it in five minutes. You can get about 80% of the way there with about 20% of the effort. And that other 20% of the effort to get the last, you know, 80% of the effort to get the last 20% is what, you know, takes all the time and skill. But don't worry about that at first. You know, worry about the simple things you know, simple approach and start off from there. So, question is roll your own. Back when I was in college and um, I used to smoke cigarettes back in those days, a pack of cigarettes cost 50 cents and that was a lot of money. So we used to roll our own. How hard is it to make your map for publication? Well, it's time consuming, requires specialized software, but it's fun and even basic skills can get good results. There's two major pieces of software you'll need. One is a bitmap drawing program. Paint is the most famous example. Um, I think everybody here has used a bitmap or most people here have. If you use um, any, any sort of Windows drawing program, you're familiar with the bitmap editor. There are expensive bitmap editors you can buy, like, like um, Adobe. There's cheap ones you can buy, and there's free ones. And I personally happen to use freeware, 
through my bitmap editor because I just got tired of paying the money for the, for the big guys. And I found out for my purposes, it, it worked fine. So I use paint, which is, which is free. You need a vector drawing program. There are open source vector drawing programs that you can get for free. But um, the difference is that uh, bitmap is, is, is a program that works with little pixels. You work dot by dot by dot. The vector program, you're working with lines, the shapes, with um, rectangles, squares, or whatever sort of polygons that you can come up with. So there's you know, two basic just types of, of drawing programs there. What I like to do is I like to, um, to combine programs. And, and most of my maps are, are a combination of three different types of programs. I also use the uh, geographic information system uh, software. I use that to make specialized base maps that have different types of geography that, that you can't get off the shelf. Uh, for example, if I'm looking for um, borders at a plant, you know, 1942 Croatia was an independent country within Europe, and you can't find those borders very, very easily, so you have to make them yourself. Um, I don't recommend starting off with the GIS program because they are hideously complicated. And it took me, I'm still learning. You know, the program I've been using for like 25 years, I'm still learning new things about it. So I, I say stick with the um, bitmap and stick with the vector. But if you want to try a GIS program, there is even good freeware there. QGIS is, 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 is an example. So if you're, if you're a brave guy or gal and you want to, you want to go whole hog, that's also available to you. Another thing you need is a source of free, copyright free, downloadable base maps. The technique I'm recommending here is don't reinvent the wheel. Start off with something that's already been made, base map. Um, take that base map and modify it using a bitmap or better, a vector drawing program. Print it out as a PDF and you'll have a map that you can use in a publication. The greater your skills are, the more complicated maps you can make. But anybody can take a map of, let's say, a blank map of the United States, add points to it in the program, and then add labels to those points. And you have something that's pretty decent. You know, it's, it's not that hard. There's a lot of things you need to take into account when you're doing this for publication, but I'm, I'm going to cover a couple of those right now today. Right now today. I should repeat the two caveats here. Software is very expensive. If you're going to go out and buy um, Adobe Illustrator, for example, which is considered the gold standard for vector drawing programs, be prepared to spend, gosh, last time I looked, it was like, what? 495 or 695 or something like that. $695, $700. That's that's a lot of money. If you're going to buy a top of the line GIS program, uh, think about three or four thousand. If you're going to buy a top of the line paint program, you know, think about 500 or so. But you don't have to spend that much money. You get it for free, and they work. They work not as well, perhaps, but good enough for our purposes here. And the second thing is learning curves can be very steep. If you are subject to frustration, um, probably best not to do what I tell you to do. But if you're somebody who likes to write, or if you're somebody who likes to model, or somebody who likes to you know, deal with minutia, playing war games and everything, you're probably a person who can deal with some frustration and you enjoy figuring out complicated things. So this is the perfect audience for that. Maybe we can do the next slide here. This is a map that I made for um, a book that I wrote that was published by Naval Institute, uh, Operation Torch. One of my purposes in making this map was to convey to the reader how hideously complicated the political situation was in France in 1942. Now, this is just a map of Vichy, or Vichy Francis. This is a map of the French state. And the French state was divided into eight or nine distinct areas representing different um, administrations, 
and political setups. So we have here, we have here territory incorporated into Germany. We have here territory that was incorporated into Belgium for German military administration. We have here territory that was closed to um, French activity and was designed for um, eventual German occupation, resettlement, ethnic cleansing, as you will. We have the zone of France that was temporarily occupied by Germany pending a, a peace treaty. We have that portion of France that was unoccupied, which was you know, the, free, the free nation of France. We have that portion of France that was occupied by Italy. We had that portion of France that was occupied, or it was demil demilitarized, so that the Italians, if they needed to um, invade Southern France, they would have a open border. And finally, we had that section of France all along the coastline that was forbidden uh, French entry, but it was a military zone. So it's nine, nine, or, nine, nine or 10 different areas, it's complicated. And I'm writing a book about Operation Torch. I don't have time to, um, to um, set forth all the intricacies of, of the French situation in 1940. It's important to the book, but it's, it's something where I, I find that conveying that in a map saved me a lot of words and gave a better picture. So this was a map that was published in a book. It was made by me. It's made in requirements to my publisher. And every publisher, every magazine is gonna have very similar requirements, but slightly different perhaps. Naval Institute, in order to accept something for publication, requires lines that are no more than, no less, excuse me, no less than one point in size. And what does that mean? And what, what does that mean at all? Every one of these lines has a certain thickness. If your lines are too thin, you're not gonna, it's not gonna show up on the book. If your lines are too thick, it's gonna look really bad. Your font sizes have to be no smaller than eight points. When, you, when you're typing um, on your typewriter on your old IBM Selectric or, or whatever, point, uh, point size is usually 12 points. That's, that's, the, that's the size of an old um, typewriter font. Eight points is the minimum they can take on a map because if you make it any smaller, you're gonna need a magnifying glass to see it. So basic rules of the road. If you're making a map for publication, if you know the basic rules of the road before you start, you're not gonna to have to redo everything you did. You're not gonna send in the map and have the publisher say, can't use it, sorry. You know, We'll do it for you. It'll cost you 500 bucks. So if you know the rules of the road going in, you'll come out much happier person. And I think that the basic, the most important things are make your lines and make your fonts where people can see it because you're working with a piece of paper here mm -hmm. and you think it's a certain size, but once it's in the book, it's gonna be a lot smaller. And on a trade paperback, I think it's uh, four and a half inches by seven and a half inches is your maximum size. So my advice to you is set up your drawing area to be the same size as the page where you're going to be publishing, and make sure that your map is what you what you're working on is what you'll see. Uh, the the big rookie mistake which I made many times in my life is to make your maps too large. Then we have to give them to the publisher. They're too small, and nobody can see anything. And you still see that in books today. I mean, I I, I look at every map that I see in a book, and sometimes I I'm just appalled by how poor the maps are, and I'm, I'm just wondering. You know, what, what, what were they thinking of? And how did the publisher ever let this get out the door? Well, Naval, Naval Institute doesn't do that. They, they make sure that it's good before it goes in. Oh, and by the way, forget about color. Um, nobody prints color maps unless you're dealing with magazine, perhaps. But most books, I say 95%, it's going to be black and white or grayscale, as I say it. So, yeah. <laughs> Get attuned to the different shades of black and white. Think about what shows up well, what doesn't show up well. You know, I use four different tones plus a half screen in this map just to um, to do what would have been very easy to do in color. You know, in color would have popped, but 
color is not an option. So you gotta you gotta be creative and work around that. Okay, so what's the basic process here? It's a three-step process. Easy peasy. You're starting off, you're making a map. Uh, in this case, we're making a map of, of um, where the turpits happened to be when she was attacked by, by um, aircraft in 1944 in, in um, Norway. I found a base map. I did, I did not draw this. I did not draw this map here. This was uh, produced uh, via Google. You know, Google Maps. Google Maps has a terrain feature, as you may or may not have noticed. And I'm able to extract terrain features without any sort of labels. I don't want anything on the map because I want to put whatever is going to be on there, I want to put it on myself. So I found a, a, um, a base map that fitted my scale, fitted my size, and I saved it as a JPEG. Screen, screen save. <clears throat> Second thing I did was I imported that JPEG into a um, drawing program. Can, can we go back one screen? Yep. I know we can do that. I don't know if you can see it or not. If you look at these lines on this on this um, outline map, you can see how jagged they are, how ugly they are. That's JPEG. These lines are nice and fine. That's vector. These lines are kind of bad with JPEG. Can you guys see that? You can see when it's blown up. It's on the when it's on the page. You can't see it. Can, can we go back to the beginning? Um, this map right here started off live as a blank uh, screen capture. It's a Google map. I elected to use elevation on this map because turpits are target here, that little, that little oval shaped object you see there, was anchored deep in a fjord and the fjord had steep cliffs around it. If you're looking at a map that just shows um, <clears throat> no terrain features whatsoever at all, you don't get that impression, you don't know it. You don't know how brave those aviators were that actually attacked the ship. You don't know how well protected the ship was. Looking at this, you get some sort of clue as to that fact. You can see that the airplanes had to come up, basically a valley. They had to come screaming into a very narrow, very deep fjord. They had to make a tight turn in the valley to get out of there, surrounded by anti-aircraft batteries. And I, I think just a simple map like this gives you an idea of what was going on that day, much more than just reading about it. Yeah, the planes came up through the valley and they had to bomb the ship and this, that, and the other. Look at a picture at it and go, wow, you know, the ship is pretty small. You know, this, this, where it's at is, is it's kind of difficult. And for me, that's, that, that gives more value to your work. Let's go. Okay, so that, that, that map there that you just saw was like this. That's how it started off. I went into my, um, I went into my um, bitmap program, imported it in there, and um, got a blank screen. I went into my vector drawing program and I said, well, okay, I, I drew a little silhouette of a ship here. And I stuck that in there because that's eye candy. That's eye candy right there. Um, 40 nautical miles that away. I added a little arrow here. Turpits, you know, if I could have made a flash, I would have made a flash, but I couldn't. That'll, that'll be in about 20 years from now, you can do that in your books, right? <laughs> And I just kept adding things. Go back to, can we go back to the very first? I just kept adding things. These are little symbols I added. I drew myself some little airplanes, stuck them on there, eye candy, and just slowly added. And this book, this map right here, which I did in 2019, will appear in a Naval Institute publication in color, I hope. Um, White Jack, 
Yes. Okay, good. Uh, this year. And you know, it, it, it works. It works, I think. So anyway, an example of a couple a couple things that I've added to, uh, added to this map. And I could keep adding in, indefinitely. Um, that whole scene that we just saw, that whole map is this area right here. Here's the fjord. Here's the valley they had to fly up, the valley they had to fly out. So you, different scales, you can show, show things different ways. You can give the reader an idea of geography, the influence the geography played in what happened. And I think it really, really can make your work much better. And there's no reason why anybody who's doing anything, if you're writing fiction, if you're writing nonfiction, if you're writing naval history, if you're writing anthropology, if you're writing pottery techniques in New Mexico, it doesn't matter. You know, you're gonna need a map. You're gonna need a map, I, I guarantee you. And a map or two or three or four will make your book that much better. You know, I, I used to get these, these contractual requirements say you shall have no more than five maps in your books. Well, that's, that's not gonna happen. And um, I, I've been fortunate in that I, I'm allowed to put as many maps as I want to in my books. And I think, I think they, um, they benefit from that. And folks like John Parshall, who was just on, John is a very talented um, graphic artist himself in his own right. If, you, if you've ever seen Kaigen, he did all the work for that. Uh, Shattered Swords got wonderful graphics in it. And you know, he's, he's far better than I am. He, he teaches me techniques. So the idea of the, um, of the um, artist historian, if you will, is a valid one. And I think, I think it's a path that everybody can kind of walk down to one degree or another. And I'm, I'm here to um, share my techniques with you, share my opinions, and to answer any questions that people might have in regards to um, possibilities or if you need you know, tips or techniques or, or whatever, I'd be more than happy to share you know, the knowledge that I've developed over the last 35 years. You're doing stuff like this.